Hello, everybody. Sorry I'm a little late. I have been having some royal tech stuff today, tech issues. I think it's just, uh, it, isn't it in the waning days of Mercury being in retrograde? Certainly seems that way. Anyway, um, so, yeah, I actually, you know what it could be? I just got a new MacBook Pro, one of the M1s, and uh, I think my iMac is uh, jealous. <laughs> so, so it's acting out. It's it's being a bad boy. Um, I've had to reboot and all kinds of crazy issues tonight. So anyway. You're also spoiled already with the M1 chip. Yeah. I'll tell you what. The, uh, the M1 MacBook Pro, good God. I think it's lightning fast. Um, they brag about how quick it is, but it's actually true. And I've had mine since, what, November? Something like yeah. that. And I've been telling them this, but it's amazing. I'm a slow adopter, <laughs> apparently. Not really. As much as a tech nerd I am, I still still sometimes takes me a while to uh, to get in, get in on the fun. Actually, it takes, uh, I ordered my um, MacBook Pro a few months ago. It just took them a while to get caught up with orders. And I'm still waiting on a Mac Studio. Hopefully, that'll be here end of the month, give or take. Uh, but anyway, I thought it would be cool to talk about photo lessons learned from shooting daily, which I mostly do. I always have a camera with me, but uh, some days you just don't see uh, the kind of pictures that you may want to take, especially if you go to the same spot every time. There's that. Um, but we're also looking for tomorrow, and um, we're heading down to a gem and lapidary wholesale show but uh in north carolina but um we're also hoping to be able to spend some time in the smokies shooting and uh so we thought eh, since we're going to be hopefully getting some awesome shots there why not talk about photos here it's actually been a while since i've talked about photography even though it's probably the one thing that i do just about more than anything else other than you know meditate and get downloads and stuff like that uh so let me do a formal introduction for tonight's training and then we will get right into it let me go full screen before i do that <laughs> there we are hello everyone welcome to expert media webinars this is your host and teacher tony leidig Dun, dun, dun. Um, welcome to tonight's episode. We are going to be talking about photo lessons learned from shooting daily. And not quite sure how long we're going to go tonight. We'll go as long as we need to go, um, which is usually my rule. But that said, I thought it would be cool to start off with the whole notion of the best camera. And the best camera is the one that you have with you. I mean, if you think about it, you don't have any way to take a photo, then uh, kind of a moot point to try to capture moments. And of course, you know, most if not all of us have a smartphone, so there's that. Um, and uh, it's, I, honestly, I probably take more photos with my phone than with uh, the cameras that I have, and I have quite a few, but, there's something, for me anyway, there's something about capturing moments. And it, maybe it's to help us remember because we enjoy them. Maybe it's to just serve as a record of our journey or exploration or discovery or whatever that may be. But I, I personally believe that at the heart of all of us, we're all storytellers. In one form or another, uh, we have a deep desire to tell stories. And whether it's for our own benefit or for the benefit of others, honestly, it doesn't really matter. Um, although I, I think it's cool to share uh, photos that you take. I mean, even if it's like with your grandkiddos and all of that, very often we're just trying to 
capture something quick. And so me included, you know, isn't the best frame job or anything like that. But um, uh, I mean, you should see my phone. You, some of you may have more photos on your uh, phone than I do. I think I'm only at about 25,000, but, um, but yeah, we want to uh, capture the moment. And some people I think often separate, like they have different ways of looking at photography, you know, um, and so, yeah, you snap a picture with your phone, which used to be like the Instamatic or the point and shoot, which I guess there are still point and shoots. And so that's not necessarily considered photography, although I would beg to differ. Um, and then there's, you know, you kind of go uh, up the ladder in professional quality based upon how much money you're spending on a camera. But I'm here to tell you that whether you're using the latest smartphone or you're using a high-end camera, there's really not a huge amount of difference between those two when it comes to capturing a moment other than like exposure control and um, pixel resolution and stuff like that, which we'll talk about a little bit here in a moment. But at the end of the day, uh, what I found is that uh, even though I have a lot of cameras, um, I also use my iPhone a lot. And I have an everyday carry kind of camera um, that I'll show you in here in just a moment or so. But um, I've had just about every kind of camera you can imagine over the years from professional 4x5 uh, cameras. I've had several of those to um to instamatics to um you know 35 millimeters going back even further in the day uh, to the latest and greatest digital slrs and everything in between and one thing i've noticed is that whether the camera cost you two hundred dollars or five thousand dollars you can still take a shitty looking picture pretty easily <laughs> <laughs> so it isn't the gear, which is good news. Um, I remember several years ago, I gave a buddy of mine a camera. I had an, uh, I like giving cameras away. I've probably given away a dozen of them. And uh, he was one of the recipients, and he's still using that exact same camera years later. And uh, at the time, he wasn't really doing a lot of shooting, but he was just kind of getting into it. But just with that one camera, he has started a full photography business doing portraiture doing landscapes and all of that and he's really developed a cool style i mean it's different from my style and that's perfectly okay um, that's part of artistic creative expression right um and so it isn't so much the camera now what i'm using right now or what i have right now uh, my main shooter is a fujifilm xt3 it's not their newest model um, but I do have all the fun zooms, like all of their top uh, zooms, uh, mostly because I traded in a lot of my old gear that I just wasn't using anymore and uh, made enough money off of the old gear um, to be able to buy lenses. And so I got rid of a bunch of gear that was taking up space, uh, ended up with five grand with uh, trading those in and then turned around and spent all five grand on Zooms. Um, <laughs> it's not hard whenever they're like $2,000 a piece. But um, I love this camera. It's just a great camera. It's very reminiscent of the good old days. My very first camera that I purchased myself was a Canon AE-1 back, gosh, back in 19... 81, I think, is whenever I bought that. I had an FTB before that um, by Canon. Uh, but I like the Fuji because it has all the old style buttons on it, uh, like the knobs and everything on the top, just like the, uh, the A1 did. Very reminiscent, about the same size. I've owned several Canon cameras, and they're bigger uh, typically these days. Um, and so I just like the smaller form factor. And then um, the camera that I carry with me daily, I just recently purchased the X-Pro3, and I have a 23 millimeter lens on it, but um, I bought it because, partly for a challenge, it's a rangefinder kind of camera, um, 
And so, you know, no digital SLR, no through the lens focusing or anything like that. Uh, it really is like a true rangefinder. Uh, and I like it. And the reason why, I mean, it takes a great picture, but more than that, because you don't have all the interactive focusing and all that kind of stuff, you're literally just looking through a rangefinder. Um, it provides a challenge, you know, fixed lens. Well, actually, it does have interchangeable lenses, but I only keep a 23 on it, uh, which is a wide angle. And so it forces you to be more creative, I think, because you have limitations. I mean, even your phone you have, depending on the phone you have, um, you have two or three or maybe four different lens choices. Um, but with a rangefinder and a single um, a single lens, it kind of limits you. Uh, and I found that it's actually forced me to be more creative with my framing and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, so, yeah, it's very cool. Uh, Shocker Coach. Yeah, I still have my A1 as well. I still have the original, which is awesome. Um, I, I mean, I have used it a few times, but uh, not recently. You know, I mean, they still there's still places that develop film and stuff, which is very cool. Um, I also have several Lumix cameras. Just bought the new GH6. Uh, we have a GH5, a G100, a G7. Um, the first three we use primarily for video. So that's what we're using to shoot pretty much all the video that we're producing for Unscripted and Magical Life um, are those cameras along with uh, GoPros. And then the GH7 is um, converted to infrared. So it only shoots infrared. Um, and I don't use that very often, but still kind of cool to have. Uh, and then I still have my 5D Mark III, which we only have a couple lenses for that these days, mostly like a probe lens and a couple other things. So I only use that for specialty type stuff, um, like once every couple months, and that's about it. And then um, iPhone 11 Pro. Kristen has a 12 and a Pro Max. I'm holding out for the new one whenever it comes out in September or whatever, they're saying that the new iPhone is going to sport a 48 megapixel camera. We'll see. That'd be awesome if it does. Um, I'm due for a replacement, but I've, I'm holding out for that. Um, and so, again, the, the camera does matter, but it also doesn't matter. Okay. It's kind of, it, it really comes down more to, yeah, there are some rules that you can follow. And we'll talk about some of those later that can help you shoot a better photo. But I've always been a big fan of approaching photography from the perspective of it just being personal artistic expression. You're capturing the moment. Um, there's a certain element of it being cathartic almost you know like a meditative kind of experience doesn't have to be i mean i've worked professionally as well and you know whenever you're in a museum in the middle of the night with two armed guards photographing jewelry and stuff um you're not feeling particularly meditative <laughs> you know <laughs> there's a lot of pressure there especially when you're shooting film so you have no idea until like two weeks later if the pictures even turned out. Um, I wasn't a big fan of that, even though I did it uh, down Atlantic City. But um, but for me these days, photography is just more about an immersive experience, you know, just capturing something. Uh, and sometimes it's very spur of the moment. Sometimes I take gear and nothing happens, nothing to speak of. And other times I don't take gear and you see the most amazing things. That's just kind of how it is. However, I have found that the more you're out with the intention of capturing images, uh, the more chances are increased that you're going to discover something really cool. I'm a big fan of bad weather. Um, just because usually bad weather means some pretty crazy cool atmospheric conditions like fog and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, here are some photos that I've shot over the last month, I guess. 
looking at these. Yeah, probably over the last month that I've shot with my phone. Um, so several, as you can see, they're all from the same general area that I go to every day. Um, depends on how much I explore. Uh, the one in the upper left was really fun. I didn't have any other camera with me other than my phone. And so, um, I called this ghost mountain because it was really foggy right up on top of the mountain. They had been, they did some logging in this area a year ago. And so, you know, they left some trees standing, but not many, but, uh, just really with the iPhone 11 pro and the various settings and everything, you can still get some pretty cool things like this one down here in the bottom middle. I kind of like because the sun was shining through the trees, uh, and it was kind of wreaking havoc on my exposure. And so I decided to move it just off screen so that it would create these little light streaks with rainbows in it, which I thought was kind of cool. And you can get some pretty surprising close-up shots with the iPhone. I, I've never used anything other than iPhones except way, way back in the day, um, BlackBerry. I had a BlackBerry Storm. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Uh, everything else since has been iPhones, but I'm really amazed at the close-up capabilities that this has, and it does a pretty decent job at managing light when you're shooting directly into the sun. Um, like you can see here, you, um, there was some rain happening, and so you get light streaking and all that kind of stuff, and occasionally you even get fairly close enough to wildlife to where, you know, you can get a decent shot with a phone. Although I wouldn't really recommend a phone for wildlife photography. But again, if that's all that you have, then, you know, you got to go with it. And so um, working with a dedicated camera that's apart from your phone, there's a lot of advantages, honestly. Again, doesn't necessarily have to be expensive, but I am a big fan of having a dedicated camera, as you could tell earlier, <laughs> several dedicated cameras. Um, but usually you'll get higher resolution. And and one thing that I want to uh, help you understand, and, and maybe you already understand this, and that's fine, is that like if you have, say, your phone shoots at, let's just pick a random um, resolution. So let's say your phone shoots at 24 megapixels. And then you have a, a point and shoot that shoots at 24 megapixels. And then you have a digital SLR that shoots at 24 megapixels. Understand that they are not all the same. I mean, the 24 is the same as a number, um, but not all megapixels are created equal. A lot of it has to do with the size of the sensor and those kinds of things. So bigger sensor equals better quality. Um, your phone has these tiny little sensors in it, so they may be able to pack 24 megapixels into the size of that sensor, but that compared to like a, a three or four thousand dollar digital SLR, which these days would shoot more than 24, but um, it may have a full frame sensor, so the quality is going to be better. Uh, so megapixels. While it can be a sign of higher quality, it isn't the only sign of higher quality, okay? Um, you do have the ability to use larger lenses. So again, great shots with my phone. I'm really pleased with the results that I get, but you know, look at your own phone. Those lenses aren't very big. You know, they're kind of small compared to like one of the couple thousand dollar zooms that I have that, you know, could be certified as a weapon or as a lens, you know, your choice. Uh, <laughs> but the it's better quality glass, it's much larger. And um, usually you have zooms or primes. And uh, so just by swapping out the lens gives you a lot of different options. And so that's a benefit that you just don't have with uh, a phone especially some point and shoots will um include like a mega zoom in there a couple of the ones that i've had um had um pretty decent zooms and again consider the package size as um 
a contributor or not to quality. Uh, interchangeable lenses, of course, um, we talked a little bit about that. That can be a big deal. Uh, dedicated uh, digital SLR or similar um, usually has a better dynamic range. Um, one thing that you'll find that I see this quite a bit in my own iPhone photography is that when you start pushing those images in a program like Lightroom or something like that, um, especially in the, uh, the brightest and the darkest areas. So like in the shadows and highlights, those images can fall apart pretty quickly where they really look like crap. And, uh, you, typically you, uh, have a better result using, you know, the higher end you go with a, a digital camera, the better dynamic range you're going to have. So you can push them as far as exposure and low light and those kinds of things a bit further. Uh, you also usually have more exposure control. I, for me personally, like with my phone, obviously I just go with, with automatic exposure. You can use other apps like uh, camera plus, which I really like a lot um, to give you flexibility with exposure and uh, pro cameras. Another one that I like to use uh because of the additional control but again you only have so much control i am one to shoot manual i i just prefer to set all of my own controls and i'm i'm good enough at it because i've been doing it for years where i can just look at light and have a pretty good idea that if i set the shutter speed at 125 the f-stop is going to need to be eight or whatever and usually i'm pretty darn close um but that's just from practice makes better um there's nothing wrong with using auto settings although i um i i guess with the rangefinder that i have right now i am using aperture priority um because it, with the rangefinder it's really hard to uh, you you can't get immediate feedback on whether you're over or underexposed. Um, and so I just set it to aperture priority where I can choose whatever aperture I want. And then the camera itself will set the shutter speed. Um, and it also has shutter priority where it's the opposite. You set the shutter speed and the camera picks the aperture. And then you have full auto, full manual, you know, a lot of different options like that. Um, there's also other benefits with a, a more dedicated uh, digital SLR or digital camera. Um, some of the, you know, just some of the simple controls like more advanced white balance control, um, the ability to shoot raw uh, can be a big deal because it gives you a lot more pixels to work with uh, in post-processing. Um, you know, some of those kinds of things. And so, again, it doesn't have to be an expensive investment. Just start with what you can afford. Uh, and there's some really great cameras out there now that really aren't that expensive. The technology is just amazing what they're doing uh, with it these days. Um, Debbie says, I bought a EOS Rebel T6i back in 2015, but use my Android phone more because it's handy. Yeah, I understand. I get it. Um, it's a little like whenever I carry my Fuji bag with me, it's 35, 40 pounds, you know, a body and four lenses. Um, it's a lot to lug around. Um, the, uh, the my daily shooter if you will which is this one here the fuji uh x pro 3 it's ultra lightweight so you know i can um you know just go wherever and i'm they're getting ready to release a new pancake lens uh that's a 27 millimeter the one in this picture is a 35 i'm using a 23 but um i just want it to be compact uh, so that it's almost as convenient as just carrying my phone, you know? Um, and I, I mean, I could put my big lenses 
on this, the big zooms and all of that, but I really have no desire for that. Um, now, if I see animals when I'm up in the mountains, getting a close-up shot with this camera here is not going to happen. It just isn't. And so that's why sometimes I'll carry, um, you know, my full bag, but usually only maybe once a week, if even that. Uh, Shocker Coach says, I find I can compose better with the viewfinder on my SLR than using my phone, especially in bright light. Yeah, I think, um, I, I would tend to agree with you on that. Yeah, because, you know, you're looking in the viewfinder. I mean, a lot of people these days are used to just like looking, uh, on the screen, and to me, that's just kind of weird. It just feels weird, especially coming from film back in the day. But there are some benefits to it. You know, if you have a flip out screen and you can, you know, get really low with the camera and then look straight down into the backing screen, uh, especially if you like photographing like flowers and mushrooms and stuff like that, like I do, um, that can be kind of cool. But for the most part, I'm looking through you know, the camera's viewfinder. And I like it a lot better because again, I think it manages light better than what our phones typically do. And you can see here again on this, uh, uh, this camera, it, it's a true range finder. So whenever you look through here, there's like a little rectangle that tells you how much of the full frame this particular lens is gonna capture. And so everything is in focus. You can't see depth of field. Um, it will tell you whether you're in focus or not, um, and it'll tell you what the um, exposure settings are based on how you have the camera set up. But that's it, you know, pretty simple. And again, it has the classic physical uh, knobs that you can turn just like the old classic rangefinders. Um, and I like that. I mean, I have some of the old Canonets and uh, Yashica mats and some of those old range finder still, but they're packed away in storage. And uh, let's see, WS, what do you think of the Snap-on aftermarket lenses for the Apple phones? Um, we have some, and what I would recommend, I think they, they're fine and they'll do a good job. Uh, you wanna buy the most expensive ones you can get though, in my opinion. It makes a difference. And I forget which brand we have. Kristen bought um, the one. Um, I want to say Moment. The ones from Moment, I think, are the ones that she got. Me personally, I don't use them. But I think they serve a purpose that can really come in handy. Especially, you know, if you want to get something more close up and you don't have another option, I think they can work really well. All right, so the next set of images are some of the ones that I shot with my Fuji. So some of these are from the uh, X-Pro3 and some of them are from the X-T3. And so big benefit, you can get closer, you know. So like the deer here and the rough grouse and the eagle and this deer, I shoot a lot of deer pictures, apparently, um, you know, so like these uh, deer pictures here and the rough grouse, I think I shot with a 70 to 200. And um, I think this deer picture and the eagle was like, a, I want to say 150 to 600 or something like that, whatever it is. It may not be that one. Same with the turkey here. Um, but understand that like the majority of these pictures don't look like this straight out of the camera. They're all post-processed pretty much every photo that you see everywhere online or in print or whatever is processed in some form or another. That's the beautiful thing about, uh, digital photography to me. Um, not only can you capture a moment, but then you can go in and craft it afterwards and turn it into whatever you want. I'll do a little bit of a demo here in a bit, um, just to kind of show you a, a little bit of my process in Lightroom. Um, and so,
It's thinking about it. There we are. So for landscapes, uh, wide angle lenses are often the best because they have a, a wider field of view. Um, 35 to 24 uh, going back is a standard wide angle. 24 to 16 is a wide. Below 16 is typically considered an ultra wide. And then you have uh, fisheye lenses, which are either circular or diagonal. And those are usually creating some kind of a distortion. They can still be fun to play with uh, to get a special effect or whatever. Um, and normally they're available as prime lenses, which means like it's just 35 millimeter or as a zoom, which um, very often, I think with my Fuji's, I think there's, um, I forget, an 8 to 16, and then a 16 to 35, and a 35 to 70, and a 70 to 200, and it just typically goes up like that. Um, so my solution is to get all the above, but that's me. I wouldn't recommend that, uh, and it can be expensive. Um, and so... Uh, many phones like the iPhone 11 Pro, 12 Pro, whatever the latest one is. is it, are we at 13 yet? Maybe. Um, offer wide and ultra wide options. And the, usually the default is wide. And then you have like with the iPhone, you have like 0.5 X, 1X and 2X, I think is how mine is. And so the 0.5 is an ultra wide and then um, the 1X is a wide and then the 2X I would still kind of consider a wide, even though it it physically uh, 2Xs the uh, field of view. And so just to kind of give you an idea from a comparison perspective, and these are images that I shot a little while back on my Fuji. So this is up at the lake where I go, uh, and you can see like um, – uh, eight millimeter at 12 at 16 at 24 at 35 55 70 100 135 and 200 and so it, it's amazing how much of a difference the lenses will um, will make as far as getting you closer or far, further away and so if you um, you know, as you get to know how these lenses function and the field of view that they offer, you can really use that to your benefit in framing shots and in capturing things that may not just be your typical photograph. Uh, and the same is true, like here you can see in the woods, um, the same uh, focal lengths, but again, this time we're kind of shooting trees and ferns and stuff. Um, but what a difference it makes, right? As you, um, as you go in, uh, Vicki says, I found about 300 slides I shot in 1985 with a beautiful Nikon on a trip to Kenya, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Now to scan them into the computer. That's awesome. Um, yeah, for me, uh, scanning, I have a, uh, Epson V600 photo, and I really like it a lot. It comes with adapters for uh, like 35 millimeter film, uh, 120 film, and then there's one for slides. And so I think the slides holds like, I want to say eight or nine. I forget. It's been a little while. I, I have boxes of slides that I've been slowly scanning through. Um, but what's cool is like you put the plastic thing. Um, so the, the, the scanner, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, you can use it to scan documents or scan slides. So there's a document thing that slides out so that the, uh, the scanner's um, light can shine through the film or slides. And then uh, you put the, the slide tray in and then load it up with all the various slides, how like the eight or nine or however many it takes. And then the, the scanner software will just scan through the whole thing, high resolution. And then um, 
save them wherever you choose to have them saved, each one individually, which is super cool. So, I mean, literally you're scanning multiple slides at a time, which it does the same thing for film as well. So it does save a huge amount of time, hell of a lot better scanning eight slides at a time than one. Right. <laughs> and that's what I've been doing. Uh, not since we moved, but before we moved, I was scanning slides. Um, yeah. So when it comes to getting the best shots, there's a lot to be said for planning. Um, I, I, it's funny, uh, starting about a week and a half ago, it was spring gobbler season here in Pennsylvania. And, um, the first day, I mean, I'm in the mountains every day, right? So, um, the first day was insane because you had cars and trucks parked all over the place and, you know, people in their camo going out to kill the turkey. Well, I know where the turkeys are in the mountains because I see them all the time. And the funny thing was that here's all these guys out in the mountains hunting for turkeys and they're in all the wrong spots. They're not where the turkeys actually are. I know where the turkeys are. Right. And, um, so it was just kind of funny to me and and especially funny was even though there's all these hunters out there hunting turkeys me not a hunter used to be when i was a teenager but me just driving up in the jeep with my camera i saw turkeys every day practically you know just run across the road in front of me or you know sitting alongside the road <laughs> i mean big gobblers and everything right they're just there and the uh, hunters are elsewhere. So it was just kind of funny. But to me, um, photography is a lot like the weekend hunter, right? They figure, oh, well, legally, I'm allowed to go up into the mountains here and go hunting. And hey, I mean, it is spring gobbler season. So I'll grab my trusty shotgun and I'll go up here and and maybe I'll see a turkey that I can shoot and we'll have it for Thanksgiving this year, right? And uh more than more times than not, they're going to go home empty handed. Why? Because they didn't do any planning. You know, I mean, if somebody asked me and say, Hey, I noticed you're up here a lot. Where are the turkeys hanging out? Like, I'm not going to tell them. I don't want the turkey shot. I enjoy seeing them every day or, well, I don't see them every day, but I see them quite often. Um, <laughs> so it requires planning. you got to do your research uh, to get a good shot. Um, JD, the, uh, scanner is the, the full official name is Epson Perfection V600 Photo. Okay. Actually, let me, uh, if I can discover my mouse here, I'll just put it in the comments. Uh, Epson section v600 i don't know if they have a newer version out now or not i bought this one um a year or two ago there you go all right so from a planning perspective um always a good idea to research and scout areas where you might want to shoot i kind of picked up on this uh back in 2012 when i started photographing the sky every day uh some of you may remember that photo series i called it skies 365 and um one of the things that i really learned like i shot that series because i i wanted to kind of shift my daily thinking to live more in the present moment than just you know looking at the future or looking in the past and that really uh, was amazing. I mean, it really accomplished that. But one thing that I learned pretty quickly was that if I wanted to photograph sunrises or sunsets, especially, or moonrises and moonsets, um, I needed to know where I had clear shots. You know, just really that simple. That's what it came down to. So, you know, uh, where do I have clear shots of the horizons? and what time do they rise what time do they set and there's apps for all of that kind of stuff that'll tell you where when the sunrise is and where it sets i mean one app that i used on a regular basis i don't recall the name of it right now 
Um, you could literally hold your phone up um, toward the horizon and it would like uh, augmented reality overlay the path of the sun or the moon so you could see exactly where it's going to rise or set at any given time, uh, which was super cool. And so um, when it comes to uh, areas that you begin to know that are very photographic or you just like being there or whatever, uh, see what those areas look like different times of the day, uh, different seasons. There's a lot of areas around here in PA that I love. And so I've been there day and evening. I've been there all four seasons. And um, it just, I love it. I mean, it's just really cool. And then, of course, um, natural element time, sunrise, sunset, tides, if you're photographing the ocean, especially uh, anything like that. You want to know when it's high tide or low tide. That makes a big difference. Um, and then you also want to bracket your shots and shoot lots. And what bracketing means is... Um, for me, I tend to shoot underexposed by about a third of a stop. So like if your camera is recommending, say, 1 25th of a second at F8, I will very often shoot at maybe F5.6, at F8, um, you know, maybe at F11, uh, something like that. So I'll go over to underexposed. And then... Um, Another thing that I like to do, and one of the reasons why I like the X-T3, is that I tend to shoot in burst mode, which means that you um, basically will fire off maybe three or five or ten shots in a very rapid succession. And you might think, why on earth would you do that? Because you end up with like eight or ten of the exact same thing. But you actually don't. There are some differences here and there, and I'll show you an example maybe later of a deer that I photographed. Um, and so your only limit really is the amount of card space that you have. And so why not shoot lots? I mean, cards are pretty inexpensive these days. Uh, and so, you know, just go for it. The other thing is, um, uh, don't be afraid to experiment with different angles. Shoot high. Uh, from up high, shoot laying on the ground, shoot on your side, go from the left angle, go from the right angle, um, you know, do all kinds of stuff like that. I, I always try weird angles and those kinds of things, because what I found is that just doing simple things like that, you can get some pretty decent end results. Um, and so just to kind of expand on the the idea some of the variations on the theme for getting that fun moment captured um is um uh, as i mentioned time of day morning noon, and night has a big impact and i'm primarily talking about landscapes but a lot of this these rules will apply to any kind of photography uh the time of the year four seasons depending on where you live uh, the atmospheric conditions, sunny cloud, rain, snow, etc. As I mentioned earlier, I like going out in bad weather. I love chasing storms. But there's something about a rainy day and going up into the mountains. We had a lot of rain this past week, last week, or over the weekend, I guess. Um, but whenever you have, especially whenever there's big uh, barometric shifts, uh, it will often create clouds or, uh, well, obviously there's clouds, but fog and some of those kinds of things. And so as a rule of thumb, the worse the weather gets, uh, usually you have less light to work with, but you can discover some really cool atmospheric conditions. Um, and so, you know, low pressure systems switching to high, high switching to low, all of those things create some pretty cool things depending on where you live. Um, so humidity and fog. Um, humidity can be a lot of fun, uh, especially high humidity in the summertime because, again, anything that you're putting into the air, uh, like sun shining around trees in a humid environment, you're going to get really cool looking um, like beams in the 
you know, in the atmosphere, fog will often do the same thing. It's the only way you're going to get those kind of shots is usually when the weather is crappy. Uh, it's just how it is. That's why I love going out in it. Of course, the direction that you're pointing to, obviously, um, you have east and west for sunrise and sunset, but it's never due east or due west. You know, it's always like northeast to southwest and all of that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, point of view, um, smoke from fires, smog, dust storms, all of that kind of stuff can really create um, some really cool environmental type uh, photographs. I remember several years ago, probably eight or nine now, I was at uh, the Grand Canyon and there was a lot of forest fires happening fairly close uh, at that particular point. And so there was a lot of smoke uh, in the air, but I'll tell you what, the uh, the sunsets and stuff because of the smoke, man, just really cool atmospheric conditions, you know, where you have like the different mesas and everything. And the further they are away, the more they fade off into the background. And so you get this amazing depth to, you know, all of the mesas or the mountains, like same thing, shooting from up on top of the Smokies, like Clingman's Dome, uh, very early morning when the fog is rolling in and there's humidity in the sky or in the air, uh, you get this depth of the mountains and I, I love it. I mean, it's just really cool. <laughs> yeah, Tom is right. You definitely can run into lens fog with humidity for sure, especially if you're going uh, from the nice warm house out into the cold uh, in the wintertime, if you're shooting, uh, very often a good idea if you're planning on shooting, say, in the morning in the wintertime, um, to give your camera time to adjust to temperatures. And same with the opposite. If you go from an air-conditioned house and then it's like 80 degrees and humid, um, you're going to fog your lenses. That's just how it is so you want to give your uh, camera and lenses time to adapt to the temperatures uh, and always explore in as many scenarios as possible i mean one thing that i've learned from going up to the mountains every day maybe i'm weird i don't know i mean i think that's been established but for me Driving to the same area, and I pretty much park in the same spot every day, but driving into the same area, you would think it would get boring. But I notice that literally every day, even after two years of going up there daily and a lot more even before that, there's like this excitement that I feel, you know, um, where... I, I get butterflies almost driving up there and I see the same trees, the same hills, the same mountains, the same lake, the same streams, and very often the same animals, <laughs> you know, on a fairly regular basis. But I, I love it. It's so relaxing. And like even here in town, now that we're living in a town instead of out in the country, um, even in that scenario, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for street photography, which I've um, often really enjoyed, especially in culturally uh, diverse areas like uh, New Orleans. Love shooting street photography there. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, same with like Savannah and Charleston and some of those areas. Um, but like we have a greenway, uh, like a rails to trails kind of thing right behind our apartment and it it's several miles long uh i mean i remember when there were actually trains that still ran that um but now it's just a trail and uh we can like go right behind our apartment get on it and walk clear down to uh our store nirvana outpost because it continues past there uh and it's a really nice walk and right behind our store, there's a park. And so we have waterfalls there and a water wheel and all of that. So even in that kind of an environment, um, there's still a lot of different ways that you can explore something like that. 
and it's just i don't know i think it's kind of cool uh debbie says an old time hack was to put a silk scarf over the lens oh yeah yeah i won't even get into some of those kinds of fun things there's so much that you can do it's kind of cool so let's um switch over here to lightroom real quick i pretty much use lightroom exclusively although i do have luminar uh, ai and i think they just brought out a new version of it a new version of luminar and um i forget what it's called neo maybe luminar neo luminar is a really great program for working with photography i i just kind of like lightroom you know <laughs> old habits die hard i guess but this is um this is some photos that i shot in December, looks like December 2021. And uh, you can see, you know, this particular shot in the sky, there's what, like nine photos. And then um, these here that are kind of underexposed, it was kind of early in the morning, uh, all pretty much deer. And then some turkeys, it looks like. And, and you can see out of the 46 photos that I shot total, I actually processed three of them. These three right there. And so typically what I'll do, like starting off with, um, I'll just pick this random sunrise first. You know, I was more interested in the juxtaposition of the trees and the branches being bare uh, up against the color. That's kind of what I was going for. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, presets that you can um, apply to a, a camera or to your shot as a starting point. I have, well, I have a lot, <laughs> we'll say. These are all presets. These are all presets. I have my own presets that I've made. Um, but just by like me mousing over, you can see that I can get different looks. Just by changing up the preset and all that the preset is, is just different settings over here. And you can see like black and white, I have it kind of blowing out. Um, this makes them a little bit darker. So it, it just really depends. Um, Tom asks, do you shoot raw most of the time? Um, not always, actually. I do sometimes, or sometimes I shoot both raw and JPEG. These are JPEGs uh, here. Um, but like if we start off with the, uh, with the raw uh, image, I tend to start off adjusting based on histogram. That's a big discussion that we're not going to get into here. Um, the object of the game with a histogram is that you do not want spikes happening, which you can see here, the blacks are currently blown out. And we're not gonna talk about how to fix all of that, but normally most photo editing software, you have very similar type controls. Uh, color temperature and tint, and then exposure, contrast, highlight, shadow, whites, blacks. Um, vibrance and saturation are also very common. And then um, Lightroom also has presence, which is texture, clarity, and dehaze. And those are all pretty common uh, settings. And then you can get down to tone curves. Um, you can make individual color adjustments. You can color grade. Um, and then they have like sharpening and noise reduction and all of that. And this isn't going to be a master class on how to use Lightroom tonight. We just don't have time for that. But um, there are just simple little things that you can do to uh, pop things up pretty quickly. Like uh, here, if I bring up the shadows slightly, first of all, you'll notice that my warning is gone in the histogram and it brings up just a tiny little bit more detail in the trees. Um, so uh, whites versus highlights, even though they seem like they're the same, they are not. Um, I'm a big fan, honestly, if you're not familiar with making changes to settings like this, 
it's non-destructive. So feel free to experiment, you know, just try this or that. And it's like, well, okay, that didn't work. Uh, you know, you'll find out pretty quick, but um, exposure, you can lighten it or darken it. Um, obviously, uh, contrast will usually pump up details and deepen colors. You don't necessarily um, want to do that, but in some cases you may want to. Uh, texture is another one. It brings out, like, well, I'll just do it dramatically. It'll bring out a lot of detail differently than how contrast does it. Um, but it also introduces artifacts. I don't know if you can see there's like little uh, white lines around the tree branches. And if you turn it down, uh, you can actually uh, soften it quite a bit, almost like a Gaussian blur kind of thing. If you look at the clouds, you'll notice that they're very much exaggerated as being out of focus versus um, much more in focus. Uh, clarity uh, works a little bit like uh, contrast, um, but again, different in how it processes. And then um, dehaze um, focuses on adding contrast, but also uh, vibrance in a way um, or not. You can see where you can almost it uses a different set of averaging um, techniques than what some of the other controls do. And then of course, vibrance will pop up your colors. Uh, saturation just increases everything. I almost never use saturation, but like as an example, if we increase the vibrance on this a little bit and maybe the dehaze and the clarity a little bit, it's still yellow because that's how I shot it, but we can change that very easily just by coming up here to temperature and moving the slider toward the blue and that yellow cast goes away and we can even add a little um, magenta to it if we want to give the whole picture a, a much cooler look cool is in temperature not cool is in awesome um, and then if we wanted to say ghost back the tree so they're they're not so stark um, tone curve can give us the ability to do that just by going here to the shadow uh, adjustment. Hold on, I think what I wanted to do. And just kind of slide that up, see how it, it works kind of like how shadow does, but different. And then of course you can also like click anywhere on the, curve and by moving or dragging your spot on the curve affects the exposure now one thing to kind of keep in mind is that whether you're talking about black and white or color photography everything is based on grayscale 256 levels of grayscale and so really you could say that these various points on this curve go from 255 to zero. So, you know, in this case, we're adjusting all the colors simultaneously, but we could come in, say, here to the blue and, you know, go with the 255 and bring that down and notice how blue is being removed now from the image. It's going more yellow versus if we came here to zero it's adding more blue so there's a lot of different ways to manipulate the picture based on um the the controls and so even like here um you can see we are currently on we have blue here we have aqua so like with the blue setting i could shift the hue more toward like a teal and you'll notice how like the darker blues it's changing and then i could come to aqua and do the same thing so i could shift the whole scene however i wanted to just based on using these various color sliders with the yellow there's not a lot of yellow because i removed a bunch of it but you know we could uh increase the saturation a little bit make it a little brighter 
make it a little more orange or a little more yellow so you can see how it's changing in the highlights here. Uh, we can change the luminance to make it brighter or darker. You don't want to go too crazy with it because it'll look unnatural. Um, and then, of course, in Lightroom or Luminar or any other program that you're using, once you get a set of settings like this that you really like, you have the ability to save them. That's where the presets come from. And so, like, um, if I come down here to uh, maybe Creative and just mouse over them, you can see all of the different settings that have been created that give you a different kind of starting point. And maybe you'll see one that you think is close, like, wow, look at that, that's awesome. And then pick that, all of these settings will change accordingly uh, to whatever this preset is. And then you can come in here and fine tune it. It's like, well, it's kind of cool, but it's still a little too dark for my preference. So I'm just going to boost up the exposure a little bit. And that's a lot better. You know, uh, Marjorie asks, how do you know when to stop adjusting? Uh, when you like the end result. I mean, kind of sounds like a smart ass answer, but I mean, that's really the truth. Um, you can go crazy with it just like you can with anything else. Um, that's why I, I kind of like starting with presets first, because that gives you a better idea of what you might prefer uh, as a starting point. And then, like, in some cases, you're going to get a picture and it's just, like, dark, because maybe it's kind of dark outside. You know, these were shot pretty early morning, but you might think, crap. Here's this deer, and I really wanted a good picture of him, and I can hardly see him. It's underexposed, blah, blah, blah. Well, the good news is that a lot of this can be pretty easily fixed in a program like Lightroom. Like, for instance, with this one here, if I just take the shadow slider and move it up, it's going to start to make a difference. And if I boost the exposure... right? Uh, maybe bring up the uh, whites just a little bit. So you can see shadow at 100, at minus 100. So you can get some pretty decent separation out of this image. Um, and I haven't even changed anything else. You know, all that I did was just change, make those couple changes and already it looks pretty cool. Uh, and another thing is that maybe the you were shooting quick because you're driving along and all of a sudden you realize there's a deer standing there. So you grab your camera and slam on the brakes. You know, it's like, oh, shit, click, click, click. And um, and so maybe the framing isn't the best or whatever. Well, you can crop it pretty easily just by making uh, choosing this little tool here. And um, you can crop it however you want. Um, just by dragging it down, or if you hold the shift key down, it will maintain the uh, correct proportion. So get rid of this tree thing over here. Don't really like that. Kind of play by the uh, rule of thirds um, so we can adjust our deer's head to line up pretty well with the rule of thirds. And um, hit enter. And so now, you know, we have a, a better cropped image. And Maybe we want to bring out the, his fur a little bit more. Texture will help us do that. Um, so we can boost that up a little bit. Same with clarity, maybe just a little bit. Help separate the foreground and the background. Um, and call it a day. You know, there's a lot of um, cool adjustment. And you'll notice that because it was low light and I boosted the exposure, there's some grain down here. Um, we can remove some of that just using noise reduction. You know, increase this a little bit and a lot of that's gone. You know, just that simple. And now there's AI tools that allow you to remove noise and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and it looks really good. And, uh, you know, maybe another thing you're not really keen on is this plant right here. There's a lot of different ways that you can remove that with software tools these days. Um, one method that you have here in Lightroom is um, a healing brush. 
So like if I increase the size of this healing brush and say, I just want to paint over this whole area here. It got rid of nearly all of it. So I can come back here and give it another go if I want. And it's mostly gone. I mean, I, I find for that kind of retouching, like removing objects like that, I think Photoshop is a little bit better with the uh, patch tool and stuff. But all in all, not a bad gig. And then, you know, same with like the turkeys. And you can see, like, I get a lot of good shots because they're safety and numbers. These pictures are pretty much crappy, <laughs> you know. But you see turkeys, you pull out camera and you're shooting photos and figure out what happens. You know, here's them running away. This is the photo that I processed. Um, you know, trees are in the way, they're running. I don't even have the dude in focus because he ran behind the pine branches. But like um, this one here could be fun, maybe, you know, but kind of same thing. If I wanted to start from scratch, just bringing up the exposure is going to be helpful. Hey, hunters, here they are. <laughs> They're all hiding from you. Um, but again, at, oh, and by the way, if you get in so far and you really don't like your results, you can just click reset and that turns it back to zero. But again, like, uh, let's see, retro maybe. You can see if I mouse over, you can get some pretty cool, like that one there, I, I kind of like a lot. Here, are the, uh, the, the shadow areas are kind of crushed, uh, leaning toward the blue, but that's a style that I actually like. But you can get um, pretty crazy with some of them. And I have a set of presets called Travel. Nice black and white. That one aired, not at all. So uh, ultimately, I don't know if I would say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, but it certainly makes a difference. And then uh, the other thing here, I'll show you real quick with the with Lightroom is they I was we were in develop where we were developing the images, but they also have a library setting where you can go back and review, you know, whatever you were shooting at any given time. So here's like the photo of the deer, um, sunrise, the moon sunsets that's where we were my granddaughter <laughs> lots of birds these are actually really cool pictures i think i ended up not doing anything with them but um how cool is that like the moon rising up over the mountain the clouds were a little much so i ended up not doing anything with them but more recently like this here was just uh the fifth. Um, and some of you may have seen this image on uh, Facebook. You know, little girl there hanging out. Uh, and it's funny because there's actually several other deer with her. Uh, let's see. Maybe this way. Yeah, you can see like one here looking on. This one came back because this deer was standing there and the others ran off and they're like, what are you doing? And she's like, it's Tony, come on back. And so this deer is like, Tony? And he starts, she starts walking back toward the other one. It's pretty funny. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of fun. That's kind of her feeding. But again, underexposed, which is how I typically tend to shoot more than not. Um, more deer, surprise, surprise. Um, this was the, the roughed grouse. 
this thing was hilarious because it saw me in the Jeep and every time I would drive the Jeep forward, it would follow me. And if I stopped, it would stop. If I would drive faster, it would run faster alongside me and it would get closer and closer. It was literally at one point less than three feet away from the Jeep. It was hilarious. And uh, I actually had some video of him following me along. Um, but he was kind enough to stand still and let me snap this shot, which I thought turned out pretty cool. But yeah, I, I think the biggest recommendation or the biggest secret that I can share is to just get out there and shoot. You know, it doesn't matter if it sucks, just get out there. There's a couple turkeys from a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, just get out and shoot. This one here is really cool. Um, the last day at our house before we moved, there were two eagles sitting in the trees across the street. One for each of us. It's like they were there to say goodbye. So anyway, as Debbie has so aptly pointed out and appreciatively, I don't know if that's a word, appreciatively, it is now, um, pointed out, I'd really appreciate it if you would like this video. All it takes is a click of a mouse. I mean, literally. Um, like the video. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. Um, click the notify bell. It helps my channel. And uh, I'm planning on posting a lot more tutorials on this channel other than just the weekly uh, expert media webinar. <laughs> but um, I'd appreciate it if you would do those things. One last thing before we wrap here. Um, uh, yeah, we're, wow, we're over an hour already. Um, is in light of us talking about photography, uh, I wanted to encourage you. I, I decided to take the last course that I taught on photography called Take Great Nature Photos and put it on sale for the next couple of days. Uh, it's actually cheaper than I've ever sold it before. Um, and uh, you can see a lot of my photos here that I've taken. There's actually six modules in this course, and I get into a lot of detail, um, a lot of detail. And just some of the things that we touched on tonight, uh, there's a whole module on photographing wildlife and all of that. Uh, macro photography, post-processing, uh, specialty gear, um, all of that. And then there is an additional 12 modules that are full trainings uh, from Photo Profit Essentials that I'm including as a bonus and then another bonus on how to sell your photography. Uh, the regular price is $147 on this. And I think when I originally launched it a year and a half ago or two years ago, I launched it at $67. Um, but a bunch of you don't have it yet. Uh, and so... Uh, I, par I price it down to 47 bucks for the next, well, through Sunday night at midnight, we'll say. So for the next little while, next better part of the week. Um, if you want to learn more about photography and kind of up your uh, nature photography game, this is the course. It's got every trick that I've ever figured out or tried uh, in this course. So I'm going to post the URL in the members area. I'm also going to be emailing about it over the next few days. Kristen and I are going to be traveling. We're leaving tomorrow afternoon to head to North Carolina for the Gem and Lapidary Wholesale Show in Franklin. And um, we're going to buy jewelry and rocks and turquoise and uh, all kinds of fun things like that. So we're going to be down in that general area until when are we coming home babe wednesday tuesday next tuesday next tuesday yeah we'll be home in time for the next next extra media webinar maybe maybe that day, so i don't know so watch your no e promises yeah watch your emails as to whether or not we have an expert media webinar next tuesday because that's a driving day for us and so 
if I'm happy and chipper, if I'm happy and I know it, I'll clap my hands and we'll have a webinar. And if I'm not, you're going to be giddy and exhausted. Yeah, but that can that actually could be so much fun. I was going to say me, <laughs> me giddy and exhausted can equal a fun webinar. Mm -hmm. I may talk nonsense, but it could be a lot of fun. Uh, but anyways, thank you all for the uh, encouragement about the trip and everything. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's a magical bear trip. So uh, we're going down in that capacity for that business. Um, and we're, we're going gear heavy. It's funny. We have one bag that contains our clothes and then, and toiletries. And, toiletries, and then we have four bags. One, two, three, four, five, five bags of tech. Five bags six. of six bags of tech. And three snack bags. And apparently three snack bags. <laughs> <laughs> And we're renting a car because uh, Mercedes is going in shop tomorrow um, to get some adjustments made. Needs a new computer board. Exciting. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're, we're taking, uh, I don't even know how many cameras, four or five and a drone. Two GoPros, a drone, a Lumix, your Fuji, five, our phones. Yeah. <laughs> and computers and iPads and yeah, all of that fun stuff. So <laughs> Liz says oh, snacks are important. Cameras. Yes, they are. Um, and so uh, needless to say, because we're going gear heavy, we are, um, we're gonna be shooting video, a lot of video, um, mostly for Magical Bear behind the scenes folks. Uh, I don't know if that video will be put. There probably will be something that will end up on Unscripted and Magical Life, that YouTube channel. Um, but a lot of what we're shooting is going to be for behind the scenes Magical Bear. And uh, hopefully, weather permitting and everything, some photography in the Smokies, one of my favorite places to shoot. So um, I will keep you updated as far as whether or not we'll have a show next week. And, um, yeah, if you want to learn more about how to take great nature photos, the link is in the description and I will post it down below in, in the script, in the description below the uh, video. It's not currently there. So that's all that I have folks. Thank you all very much for joining me here once again. And, uh, we'll talk again soon. Enjoy the rest of your week.